welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend or give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. Also, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us might just uh, inspire Apple to promote us a little. Now you can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I got to celebrate my birthday this last weekend by getting a head cold, which is why well, I sound a bit crappier or more of a FM radio DJ than usual. I'm supposed to visit the FDA tomorrow for work, so we'll see if they got any unapproved cold remedies on hand that I can try out. But that's about all the update you need, given how crappy I sound. Let's get to the show. This week's guest is the great political cartoonist and illustrator Peter Cooper. Peter was on a couple years ago with his fantastic graphic novel, Ruins, which wound up winning an Eisner Award the next year. This time around, he's got a new book out from W.W. W. Norton called Kafkaesque, adapting 14 of Kafka's short stories into comics. Peter's one of those pod guests I've stayed pals with, so while we have talked on and off over the last couple of years, I was glad to get another opportunity to catch up with him on mic. And having Kafkaesque out meant we could talk about literary adaptation, which you guys know is a favorite topic of mine. Kafkaesque is a wonderful collection. Um, Peter, he captures the uncanniness of Kafka's stories and the the sheer unsettledness of it all, um, the anxiety and the alienation that kind of permeates Kafka's work with this really scratchy black and white uh, style. It's it's a really amazing piece of work. And um, Kafka is a really fitting author for Peter to adapt in this day and age or these benighted times, as I think I said at the top. Um, see, one of the things about not connecting with Peter since late 2015 is that we hadn't talked on Mike since the 2016 presidential election. So I figured it would be good to uh, to see how he's dealt with that, in both his art and his life. Uh, if you know Peter's work, you will not be surprised to find that his art is very much hashtag resist. Uh, now, as far as caveats go, uh, there's New York City noise. Also, um, I think it's because we didn't use the tripod stands for the mics, but ha uh, handheld them instead. There's a weird fuzz on the first 45 minutes of the main recording, so I cut that and used the backup recorder for that stretch of the episode. Um, you probably won't notice because you're not as crazy as I am, and you'll deal. Oh, and the cartoonist at SPX that I allude to is Ngozi Okazu. I could not remember her last name when Peter and I were talking, and I did not want to screw that up. Here's Peter's bio. Peter Cooper's work appears regularly in The New Yorker, The Nation, and Mad, where he has written and illustrated Spy vs. Spy every issue since 1997. He is the co-founder of World War III Illustrated, a political comics magazine now in its 40th year of publication. He has produced over two dozen books, including Sticks and Stones, The System, Diario de Oaxaca, Ruins, which won the 2016 Eisner Award, and more. His most recent graphic novel is Kafkaesque, 14 Stories. He is currently working on an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Peter has lectured extensively throughout the world and has taught comics and illustration courses at Parsons, the School of Visual Arts, and at Harvard University's first class dedicated to graphic novels. 
A frequent guest at literary festivals, Peter enjoys traveling the world, but will always call New York City his home. And now, the 2019 Virtual Memories Conversation with Peter Cooper. So what drew you to Kafka initially, and what brought you back to Kafka now? Uh, initially, a friend of mine who was a big Kafka fan said, um, you know, you want to hear some short stories while we were, you know, having beers and we, and read it aloud. And it took on a completely different character than what I had experienced when I'd read it in high school or, or in early college reading the metamorphosis where it seemed much darker to me mm -hmm. and it just suddenly the light bulb went off on the not only the humor in it but how beautiful it would be for translating into comics and that was in 1987 or something like that and i did my first adaptation in 1988 for some small uh, underground comic and you know that that was that time period where there'd just be these maybe an anthology or World War three um, my own anthology that uh, would be a place where I might do a short story and uh, th this was uh, an opportunity to experiment with one more area of comics that was interesting to me I mean I was doing autobiography uh, I had did fiction adaptation just seemed like another area that would would be nice to explore and Kafka seemed like a like a good fit and when I sat down to work with it it was a perfect fit mm -hmm. and what brought you back to him 30 years later uh, I had well initially I did I did a collection of Kafka stories uh, in 1995 and that was before they could get into bookstores and libraries and to, with a small publisher and, and in the mid nineties, with, with the chromium covers, it wasn't really fitting into the comic store. Apparently not. Either. Yes, <laughs> not, you know, in a small way, yeah. and um, it did well for its time period, but it it hadn't gotten out that much. And uh, I I I wanted that that collection not to disappear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had done Metamorphosis. That was in ninety five that I did this this uh, short story collection of nine stories. And then it, uh, it got reviewed in the New York Times in the style section because they weren't, they would not <laughs> yeah, touch, touch graphic novels and, you know, mouse. Books. Yes. But it was really, really limited. And somebody you know, was a comic fan. It was just at that tipping point where there was starting to be mm -hmm. interest and there was starting to be people who wanted to write about it and were working for those publications. But then it was getting rejected by the, oh, well, that's not for yeah, the those gatekeepers or yeah, yeah those yeah. gatekeepers were keeping that, that kind of thing back. So I, uh, I, I did Metamorphosis in 2002, and that was a tremendous experience, which took some recovery time for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I started it, I think, in the winter or even the fall and, and managed to finish it in a pretty short period of time. But then it was still like summer, and I was still stuck in this room with a bug, and I was really starting to like, okay, this has got to end, which was kind of perfect. It was like it had it built up in me this, the, the anxiety that was in the story and that came out in the work, I think. Uh, so, uh, fast forwarding to this, this more recent collection, I just didn't, I didn't want that work that I had done to have disappeared as much as it had. And so I thought, well, I I'll, maybe I could get it reprinted, but then I got this tremendous agent and, uh, um, Judy Hansen and she, uh, said, you know, like, if you want it to be a new book, you have to, it has to be twice as long as the original. And that suddenly was really appealing because the reprint thing was not so much, I, you yeah. know, it wasn't ideal. It's like, yeah, okay. Stuff I be the people still, years ago. Yeah, yeah. And well, it, what it actually, it's, it still seemed, uh, you know, not to pat myself on the back, but it, it still seemed fresh enough to me yeah. that, and, and I was really connected to the mentality that's in there. And I think even more so given the current environment of mm -hmm. uh, the very Kafkaesque environment we're in. And so it, tr it turned out to be like this really great boost to say, Hey, I'm going to make this as a new book. And I w went from a uh, 64 page book to a 160 page book and did way more than was required to double <laughs> the book, but I was having such a great time with it. And so coming back to that material, it was just really, 
enjoyable. And then I went back into some of the old strips and I did, I reworked aspects of them that I thought would be better and retranslated it, in fact. Yeah, how did the, um, how did the earlier work contrast with the current the current stories and adaptations you were doing, and how much did you have to go in and? and I, I didn't have to go in much at all. Um, the it, with the translations, I went through a number of processes to, to to translate it. I had a German friend do a translation from the the original text. Uh, I uh, read a number of different translations. Uh, the, the 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 ones that we all know from the the Muirs and this this. Stearns, who did yeah. the the, uh, the translations from the forties and forties and fifties, which is really like the voice of Kafka that we know, and then I read more recent uh, translations, which are just way too suave for my taste. They're like, yeah. I, you know, that's a little hip, Kafka. It, yeah, it's just a little. It, it, it just didn't have the voice that I've, I've recognized, and it's you know very hard to say when you get into translating whether or not you know maybe something smoother would would be more accurate, but I just got used to the, the stiffer translations. It gives it a sort of alienness. Yes, which exactly. Which I think is, is what we experience anyway through it. So yeah, I guess it makes sense to have that in the tone itself. And, and I think, I think that was there, uh, you know, there's certain thing, you know, if you say, you know, the devil take it all to say to hell with it is more contemporary, perhaps more. Yeah. And also it, it, there's times when smooth is good because it's like, well, what is he saying here? Mm -hmm. But, Overall, I tried to, um, uh, you know, be true to the voice that seemed that I, that I knew from the other translations. And when it was translated uh, by my German friend, it was a fairly stripped down translation. Like these are the words. Yeah. And then I, you can look at that and say, and based on the other translations, I looked at how many different word choices they had, but also how they changed the sentence structure and, you know, a number yeah. of things. And that seeing that gave me more latitude to see, to reconsider, you know, word choice, but what seemed to like, like what would be a better word choice and sometimes stodgier and sometimes a little, a little more modernized. And even that would apply to the titles because, uh, uh, all the titles to the stories I did with few exceptions were, uh, Max Broad, his executor had come up with. And so that, uh, I, Turned the title that that was in in the original translation. The translation I had read first. It was excursion to the mountains into trip into the mountains, which seemed somehow excursion just seemed like a, an odd word. Yeah. And you know, journey was another option. And so anyway, it was interesting because of course it made me recognize how much these translations over the years have affected how we perceive writers and you know. Um, you know, if you get a really great translator, like I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, Murakami has a tr tremendous translator. It just right. feels like, OK, that that's nailed it. And he's alive to say you that got it right or wrong. wrong. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, that that's a really big, big part of the process. But then there's the translation that is in how the comics, how the art works back and forth with with the text. Yeah, it's and, multiple layers of translation in terms of bringing it into a visual you bring it into a visual medium in addition to bringing it into English. So. Exactly. And you know, where, where I can say, all right, the, the picture is going to pick up the, the slack here. And then the words really acted so much like an anchor that allowed me to do these experiment, experimenting with the panel structure, which when I first did this back in the eighties uh, and, and a lot in the nineties, um, it was really, uh, it, it was so liberating to see how, with an existing text, th what ideas it gave me in terms of the storytelling and, and have it go wild and yet kind of like crisscrossing with my illustration work and, uh, and yet still not lose readability. Sure. Yeah. It's something I was wondering when you mentioned fiction, autobiography and adaptation, do the built-in constraints of adaptation actually work to your strengths? You find um, having or is it just a different you know? Experience I, I mean, for it, you? it's I find it really unconstrained because yeah. the the fact that there's an existing text that's the only constraint. I mean, that there's something that's a, there. that's that is liberating yeah. for, for me because then I I don't have to come up with everything that's going to be said and and that uh, and I you know one other reason why I I turned to Kafka was my previous book Ruins was a really uh, exhausting experience. It, it took me three years to complete that. Um, that book. And I just, 
when I started thinking about like, what next story do I want to do? I really was feeling a, a little blank, not in a bad way. I didn't feel like I had, was having an artistic block per se. I just, I didn't see a story that I wanted to jump on uh, like that. And I was thinking maybe doing a travel anthology and, uh, you know, I had some different ideas floating around that I would have eventually gotten to, but the Kafka, what turned out to be a really good relieving, um, uh, yeah. the idea that Kafka is a palate cleanser is not, exactly I know it's strange, it works, strange, but, right. Yeah. But, but, you know, for the, uh, again, for, the, reset for the, it was a reset. And also for, given the time period, I feel very, uh, I have a lot of anxiety that what I'm working on relates to what's going on in the world mm -hmm. outside just because they have sustained to do a book. It, it, it's not going to work for me if I, if I'm like trying to compartmentalize and I'm doing something light and upbeat over here and yeah. which I do very little of anyway. I was going to say, there's not a lot, not there's not a threat thing. that I'm going <laughs> to suddenly get light and upbeat, but, but that, that the work reflects uh, really specifically on what's happening. And, the, and Kafka was obviously like very in the pocket for Trump and, and how did the, insanity. How did the stories change for you re uh, revisiting Kafka? Well, I assume you've been, you know, kind of dipping into his work throughout, but how different was it for you? And I hate to tell you this being 60, now, because uh, we last spoke on Mike three uh, years wait, ago. I'm 60? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't an issue <laughs> well, back then, but now it's, it's <laughs> I've got 50 coming up in yeah. two years. But um, revisiting the stories or seeing them as a, you know, in your late 50s and, and 60 versus, you know, college, your 20s, et cetera, do they change for you? Do you see things differently when you look back at the same stories of his? Um, the curious thing is that for whatever was going on with, my mindset when I, and I, and I feel like it's part of why I love, uh, translating and ad adapting his work is that it has put me in a, in a frame of mind that it keeps putting me in, in one way or another that sends me in directions that relate. Like in the, some of the original stories, I read a story and it seemed like it was about homelessness. It's called the trees and just the, the text read as something contemporary mm -hmm. like that. Uh, when I did a hunger artist, I was at the time thinking of uh, Michael Jackson and like the idea of these characters who set themselves on fire and, and do some form of, you know, self torture so that we can, for our entertainment at the very, actually at the very end of the process, I had a shedang moment when I realized that it would have been really ideal if I had made a hunger artist, a woman, because one thing that was really lacking in the book was, uh, and not, I, I, not in terms of like the checklist of what are the modern things I can yeah, do? The, that, the quota. You know, of, yeah. My, yeah. the quota of what I'm going to cover. But I was like, I, I, I was feeling that, that lacking, wanting for there to be more women characters in it. And the stories that I was attracted to had a tendency to be more, the crazier ones that involved guys for the most part. Yeah. And, um, I just thought, man, if I'd flipped that, that would have been just an ideal, Way to way to yeah. translate it as I did with um, um, before the law. You did, I was just going to say, you make an ethnic choice I, there. Yeah, That's I made an ethnic choice there, and that I started drawing it, and I had drawn it with with the, you know the generic -y white guy, and I just suddenly thought this story is really so much could translate into being about civil rights, mm -hmm. and it certainly is, it was you know that doesn't that's where I take Kafka and, and do something with it that isn't it. it, it takes it to a, you know, whatever my place as far as, um, the ideas and that I hope also with any, with any translation of, of work like that, um, doing, doing an adaptation, it's one person's perspective and it hopefully invites you to look at the work itself, the original and go, Oh wow, you saw that there. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that at all. And maybe, you know, they, then you see something different and that's part of the beauty of, or somebody like Kafka, which is, he's so open to interpretation that for me, that was, um, that's one of the joys. And I'm just saying like, here's, here's a way, one way that I can interpret it. I can see looking at it, all the different ways I could interpret the same stories too. Mm -hmm. And that's reading that particular one. I, that's exactly the experience I had, which was, I would not have made that choice. And that's because I just would have been too limited in my scope. I wouldn't have thought that way. And that's an amazing way to, to take the story and turn it into something that's, you don't even say contemporary, something that's, that's meaningful in our, our, you know, 
or ongoing age. Um, the same yeah. thing happened with the, the, the first story in their uh, trip uh, to the mountains, yeah. uh, into the mountains, was that it became cavemen. And it was also kind of a good opener in the book, like, oh, I'm going to... And that, that was... Man. I was reading it, and uh, again, it was like part of the, the process. And, and really, a lot of the times when I do something like this, it's just I'm giving myself the opportunity to kind of go to school in a writer and, and read the text... Yeah. In in a you know really parse it out and and then think about it and it's it, I really feel like I'm I'm like back in college in the best sense which is that um, I'm getting to spend a bunch of time with a work and then trying to see like you know if I had a the the teacher is the work itself and then it then I have to apply whatever information I have to it so. That I mean, you get that's what I'm doing every week, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you understand that. That's sort of I dive into people's work like this so I can figure out, yeah, their their thing and try and understand some sort of key. But which but is here. which is just I mean that's just exciting you know, all all by itself. It just gets to like what's education about it? What's the, there's something you know why why go to school? Why mm -hmm. you know be in there? I mean I teach as much as anything so that I can learn what it is that I, the subject matters that I, th I think I know. I ask all you guys about teaching. What did you have to learn or what did you end up learning over the course of teaching? And that's, well, you know. I, I, I have a, a shitty memory for, for one and that comics is such a complex form that without reiterating mm -hmm. and like saying it out loud, it really all the details, all the things that I'm, I'm explaining and pointing out that, that a student should look at and consider while doing a comic, it helps me to reiterate it for myself as well. So when I go back home and sit down to draw, all those elements are, are get, you know, they, they are at my fingertips more. And, uh, but there was a big roll up process in order to, uh, figure that out. And, and then it's a, a constant process of discovery because, Comics is run so deep. There's so many angles to it. There's so many ways that somebody can uh, approach that that art form and do things with. And students tend will do things that I hadn't expected or thought yeah. about. And I would crib for my students as fast as I hope they crib for me. <laughs> yeah. And 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 then the work that I'm showing them. And I got much more into looking at early comic strips because they're such great examples of singular like a one page piece that covers so many bases and that's what i have students do on a weekly basis is do a single page attacking a subject using a, an approach thinking a certain way but they have to do it in one page and so the, the comic strip of you know the turn of the century which was such an explosion of ideas with this new form that, that you know that almost got lost. I mean, a lot of things went away that, that they learned and knew in, as it moved in, you know, went through its history. It's, a, it's such a weird art form for having a golden age, almost from day one, that it was just such a ridiculously high level at the beginning. And then, you know, sort of bastardizes for a while, or at least gets compressed by commercial considerations and everything uh, yeah, else. Yeah. All, all sorts of things that, yeah, came in. That, that but you look at the, it. almost from the very outset and you're looking at not just McKay and Harriman, but all these other greats. And you're like, and they were all operating at the same time. What are we doing? That's you know. <laughs> no, it is it is remarkable. And then you know, I you see. Then there's another round of Renaissance that has all the people that that have since I, I got into comics. Has been so many new people coming in, mm -hmm. opening the door on it, and that's the door got kicked open in libraries and bookstores where that's like, of course, that's now considered to be it's one of the growth areas in publishing, and so that's a remarkable turn when it used to just be you, you were basically a hobbyist to do right. if you wanted to do comics well when i was growing i live in the house i grew up in and my local library when i was growing up um the only thing was the how to draw comics the marvel way book, which <laughs> i checked out on, on dozens of occasions i go in there now and it's just all these shelves of, of ya manga and you know frank miller books and all these super i'm like Okay, I, it couldn't have been there when I was a kid, but you know, it would have been nice to, to yeah, have stuff yeah. like this. But there was that there was that discovery factor yeah. that was so exciting, and you know, I, it's not like 
I, you know, you, you want to roll it back necessarily. There's a million reasons why I'm glad it's the way it is oh, now. I, I On the other hand, if the internet was around when I was a kid. You know, I would I would not be a functional human being, basically. I I would agree. <laughs> I'm you know I probably would have partaken of the stupid pleasures of the internet. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's put exactly. It that way. Yeah. So and 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 uh, there was that factor of discovery too. Is like and and getting to know people in the field because it was so limited that there was like the secret society that was fantastic. And now that's, it's impossible. I can't keep up with all the great work that's being done. And it's, it's overwhelming in a lot of ways. And that, uh, there was something nice about being able to say like in the alternative world, I could have read most everything. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and keep up with Fantagraphics and, you know, right. say, and you were pretty much on top of what was coming out that was interesting. Yeah. And now it's... Drawn in quarterly, too. You know, uh, yeah. So. Once we get to the... Because uh, that's already dating ourselves if we just say Fanta. But, yeah. You know. But yeah, at, at SPX this year, I got back from the gym, bumped into a, a woman getting on the elevator who had also just gotten back from a run and... and Introduced herself. I introduced myself just because we were the two sweaty people at SPX. And, um, I bet that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only sweaty people from exercising, <laughs> along with Michael DeForge, who's out running like 20 miles a day or something. Um, but later, when I get back down there, I discover she's got like hundreds of people lined up outside her, her table. And, you know, she's got this huge fan base. I'm like, I know absolutely nothing about this person. And she's, you know, again, somebody else who's, who's you know, kicked down the door and managed to... Um, I think in this case, it's a gay teen hockey YA book, and she's just got huge fan base. I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm that's, limited. That's I need to keep, you know. Well, it's, I, I mean, it's impossible to keep up in, in a certain way. You say, like, I'm not, I don't want to just read comics all the time, so right. I'm not going to be able to do that. And then there's also just things are targeted for different audiences, right. and there's things that interested me when I was younger that don't interest me as much now, and and you know that's a constant metamorphosis and there's some work that i i'm going to read it anyway if it's something that that's another thing about teaching is that i tend to be reading just to see like okay that's really really popular up, up to a point my kids. yeah that the students, the students are the yeah. students are, are you know all about whatever whoever it is and so i'm going to at least get, give it a peek manga i find it much more difficult to get into and it has a huge influence and i don't discourage it in the sense of like saying that that that's bad i just try to encourage them to look at something that isn't so stylistically um omnipresent that basically instantly catalogs their work as a way like okay you look like that yeah. You know, the big eye drawing thing with the sparkles in the eyes of it, and that if you draw that way, you're going to immediately you're tagged. But yeah, you're tagged. And that, that I got one student to actually do um, use Scratchboard to do his he was doing manga. And I was like showing him woodcuts. And I yeah. was like, I don't think I've ever seen that before. And he actually did something quite I, I'm visually uh, you know? there's something there was some horror Japanese comic from like the 90s I remember that had something like that. I remember seeing a cover probably from a, a Fanta translation or something but yeah that is the only instance I can think of I was going with Thomas oh the uh, uh, yeah. Scandinavian guy and that's German, Very different. I think, isn't he? German? Okay. I'm just guessing. That's yeah, you know, saying. again, I, I, think I just think Berlin, so I'm guessing. Okay, okay. That, that's, you know, again, you're the comics guy in the show from New Jersey. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, is there, was there that sense, though, of I didn't know X until I opened my mouth and told my students X when you were teaching that you didn't quite realize well, the things you knew? For sure in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, and then it got me to, uh, you know, I just had to be reading a, about, fortunately, Eisner was there beforehand at School of Visual Arts <laughs> yeah. and had done a, basically a teaching book on that that I could turn to for a breakdown on the process. But then, you know, a lot of osmosis from having read a bazillion comics and having, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, knowing the form and being able to teach it are, are different things, of course, like any subject. So there was a lot of process of digging into it and then finding elements that I hadn't talked about or hadn't looked at or hadn't been uh, sharing with students and getting having work shared with me that was then like, oh, right, of course, there's that. And that process, that's a, just an ongoing process of discovery. So uh, I, I learn, you know, I, I still learn yeah. new things about it. And there, it, it's just 
I don't want to only do uh, be looking at comics, but it is one of those subjects where, as you scratch the surface, there's just another surface under that. And if you you know if I look at uh, especially again the turn of the century, uh, previous century comic strips, there's so much they're they're so rich. There's so many aspects to them that I you could just keep coming back to those. Oh, there were things that Eddie Campbell brought up in in the Goat Getters in that book that he's just. I wish I could do a book about just this person. I wish I could do a book about the Ohio scene. I wish I could. And when you get to it, if he's not going to be making comics of his own, this is the next best thing is, you know, doing scholarship of all this amazing stuff going on turn of the century that yeah, yeah, really well, didn't have a spotlight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, um, and fortunately they're being, you know, printed beautifully in yeah. these old forms. I mean, I, I don't have the shelf space for all the quality yeah. books that are being, at, at, you know, that are coming out. Which, again, we could say we're in a golden age now, at least for, for reprints. Um, is there any trigger warning-y aspect of comics you would want to show them that you think, eh, yeah, back, again, Crumb, for example. Crumb is, is, Crumb is, the, is the obvious example, and, I, and there were things that I was showing that as... As, as times we, have changed. As times have changed. And, you know, I, I actually uh, happily... I haven't taught for the last... Uh, gosh, when was the last time? I, I guess it's been... Maybe two years or a year and a half or something like that. I, I took a little break, mm-hmm. um, and um, there it was creeping in. And it's I started to seeing it, and it's accelerated just in that last in this exact time period. It accelerated. So I was I was teaching right before the elections, and so the last two years that where it's changed actually pretty dramatically. I think where a lot of things that were you know, would have been like a, well, we should talk about it, or it was a trigger aspect, are now you don't even fairly, yeah, are, are over the line. I used to show the, I would show, there was a couple of crumb documentaries, and there was one that it just got itchier and itchier, it was clear, and, and it, it is itchy, you know, there's the material is, and I, you know, the idea that um, it would polarize the class where, you know, and I, I would usually uh, start asking like at Harvard, I asked students about this and, and we had, there was a big blazing conversation among a range of people about Crumb and, and uh, that would, was, you know, women defending him and, and, uh, and, you know, people finding him abhorrent and it, it, uh, you know, that's just gonna, that's, that's, that's also part of the dialogue, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's such a treacherous area now. And, you know, here I am. There's a, there's a lot of things that um, I'm doing, and certainly you know, and, and various work I've done that I realize you know just it won't. Some of it won't, just won't fly, or I'll do it anyway and see what happens. And and that um, like Heart of Darkness, which is, for brings example. us to your next work, which yes. is adapting the Heart of Darkness, which yes. is problematized in every era. I yeah, guess, but. yeah, no, and it's it's going to be a very that'll be a very interesting uh, um, process to see what happens with the the response because i've been very conscious of it from my own consciousness you know th- mm-hmm. that reading the book and you know the the horror of certain aspects of its periodness that it's like yeah of course i mean it's, it was written in you know 1899 it's going it's it's not going to translate in certain ways but then what's fundamentally interesting about the story does translate and in a lot of ways and it can reflect on colonialism and uh, many aspects as it did at the time I and mean, it was it, it really led the charge in certain ways of getting people to be more aware of what was going on in the congo and so and although that conrad was not promoting his position as a political figure, but other people uh, latched onto that work and held it up, and then and that led to, you know, ultimately in certain aspects changes, p- people going, well, "This is horrifying," and that you know, th- this or that is terrible. But then there's a lot of in it that was that uh, is remains horrible, and it's that um, my process is to see what it is in the story that that's working and what isn't. And and make and make decisions on how I can bring that old work forward for an audience now, which I think has a lot of it as a as a book. It has a lot of value, but there's a lot of contentious, you know, you know, tangly parts to it. How much of that did you have to work out before before drawing? 
before really you know, parsing it, you know, scripting it, et cetera, the way you're going to, to put it together? Yeah. It, well, there, I have this laborious process of breaking down the book. Um, and it was great that I had done uh, Kafka adaptations recently because I was really in the adapting rolling mode. way. Yeah, I was in an adapting mode. And uh, um, the publisher actually had suggested this book. They, they said, well, you know, we, we'd love to do the Kafka book, but but we'd really love it if you would do this, follow it with that. And that was part of like sort of our, our arrangement. And I was more than happy to. So maybe they're trying to sink your reputation completely. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's not like it's yeah. not like that. Uh, uh, it, it's a really perfect book for me because it, it, it touches on so many things that I know and that I'm interested in uh, that I've traveled in Africa. I uh, travel in general. And so the, the whole mentality of this, tr this journey that, that, uh, Marlowe is on, um, is something that I, I can really mentally place myself in. And in fact, I moved to Mexico for four months at the very beginning of the process specifically to get the additional aspects that I knew I wanted in the book, which are besides doing the visuals, our, uh, smell, and sound and temperature mm -hmm. and that if if i can have that in my mental state when i'm working it just it gets into the, it was really like that triggered memories of, of my travels where i was hiking on islands in sumatra and and you know being some really wild travel i went to new guinea and went on a 10-day trek very far in to the wilds with a really super evil guide who was stealing money and <laughs> yeah. put us in a really precarious position Jeez. where we just, we basically had to go running out of a village with, you know, for fear for our lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, that that's in working on heart of darkness. I'm, I'm, it's imbued with that. Yeah. And so I can, I can go back to those places while I'm working on it. And I think that that's another level. So I feel like I'm doing this travel book that I was interested. I was thinking about wanting to do and, and at the same time doing something that is more, um, uh, accessible to a, a wider audience. And I can once again, uh, as I was doing with Kafka, where I was experimenting with storytelling and ways to, ways to play with the form, the text, serves as this anchor and so that I, I can yet do some wilder storytelling and, and still keep the reader from getting lost, even if they are not comic readers. Yeah. Are there aspects of the drawing itself that differs from other work you've done? Do you feel you're, you're stretching in terms of the art itself that you're making? Um, it's, this landed at a really good time for me because I had a long period. I lived in Mexico for two years back in 2006 to 2008. And when I got back to New York, it was right leading up to, to the crash. And with the crash came a complete career change because all the illustration work, all the magazines I worked for pretty much, you, know, you could hear the sucking sound as they went down the toilet. And I also had gone through a transformation from being in Mexico, drawing in my sketchbook, not doing stencils and spray paint, finding that that just didn't feel well, that wasn't my state of mind for the environment, both um, in terms of the kind of laborious quality of cutting stencils and then using this totally toxic spray paint, which was definitely I, I was concerned about it affecting my health. The irony uh, being the environmentalism. Aspect yeah, of right. Work. You know, doing <laughs> yeah, doing doing like environmental uh, illustrations yeah. with uh, toxic spray paint. Also, it was, it was a little too. Illustrated. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, don't sniff this drawing. Um, then, uh, and it was a it was a fairly long period of just not being sure stylistically where I was going, and that that slowly crept into up to the point where I was going back to something more linear and drawing with pencils, but it didn't have the oomph that my more political stencil work was, you know, that was, I really had a ton of work and it, it fit with the Bush years in particular. Yeah. And so I think, you know, probably it was the environment with Obama and the, the change with the, the kind of jobs I was getting and the coming from Mexico, there were all these things colluded to have me be kind of floating for a while and and fairly unsure about what my stylistic 
and, and, you know, how I wanted to approach content too, because the sort of extreme punch in the face quality that you get from, from a, a stencil, um, just what wasn't, I was looking for different ways to talk about the same urgent subjects, but just why I wanted to, to see if I could come up with something that wasn't that same voice. And uh, I started to find it in ruins, or I, I did find it in ruins, which was somewhere between a sketchbook quality and um, uh, uh, something a little still more controlled. But then um, the style that I found turned out to be kind of perfect for New Yorker cartoons. And I was then then my sensibility as it was rolling up to the, the elections for the, the you know, Trump elections that I really was enjoying doing some kind of humor in there and having this sort of the quality of line, which was balancing between that had a little more realistic. Like when I looked at cartoons that I loved Peter Arno and Charles Adams too. So occasionally I would kind of go in that direction and something would be rougher and lighter and gain Wilson. And I mean, there's, it was like a recognition again of all these artists, you know, what you were asking me about in teaching that happened again, like, Oh, right. I am hugely influenced by New Yorker cart cartoonists. I poured over that 20th, 25th anniversary or 50th anniversary book. And I, I was, I wanted to be a cartoonist like that when I first came to New York. And I uh, just suddenly decided to, like that there was that meeting of things and I had ideas building and I was like, I'm going to do another run at this, which I've done before, but it was like, I landed on a style and a mentality with the ideas that was in in uh, apparently the right pocket and I started selling cartoons to the New Yorker mm -hmm. and then beautifully when um, there was a shift in the cartoon editor uh, Bob Mankoff left um, and um, and new younger people came in and I was I was definitely unsure whether I was going to still like I had gotten my foot in the door with Mankoff was I going to continue and they asked me. Um, uh, Emma Allen, there's there are two editors there. Um, Emma asked me if I wanted to pitch for the Daily, uh, which is a very political, of the moment kind of cartoon, and that was really what I was struggling with with the New Yorker cartoons is trying to hit on topics. That's and yet, though, your New Yorker comics aren't guy lying on a psychiatrist's couch. Sometimes they are. But yeah, most for, for the most part, they're 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 not just political, but like the you know, you're usually employing a device or you know metaphor within the the you know the visual itself that's capturing it, like the uh, uh, circular stabbing in the back uh, uh, thing, things like right. that. The five stages of White House employment. Yes, that's, <laughs> which we'll see again with the new chief of staff. It's already popped up again. Oh, that's so, amazing. Yes. Um, but yeah, there's there's a degree that you're not doing exactly a New yorker -y thing. You're doing something that's Peter cooper -y in the middle of the New Yorker that I find very interesting. Well, that, that you know, that's the ideal with something like that because it, it's, it's not sustainable to do something that is like okay. the yeah the, well for me it's it just it wasn't sustainable to do something that was oddball that it's just not the way I think and it was what I ran into over the years I, I had two other previous runs at the New Yorker where I would sell a cartoon idea and then pitch every week for six months like ten ideas and sell nothing yeah and then realize that I was trying to, too hard to do a New Yorker or something and then. For whatever, then I would divert, like take one of the ideas I'd pitched that didn't sell, and then it would go some other direction. Like I pitched one of the ideas that was more like a four panel car political cartoon to the New York Times. They bought it. The Daily News saw that cartoon and asked me to do, gave me a, a, a spot every Sunday for two years. And I was like, that's why I was doing New Yorker cartoons. Yeah. You know, that, and that fit. It, but, but it was, it was because it, I was like, getting itchy in the environment where I was trying to be a New Yorker cartoonist. So I, that was just kismet and, you know, luck, which I depend on pixie Every, dust. Every, everyone does. This is really like so much about, you know, like how, how does, how does this work? You know, where do you get your ideas? You know, aside from you know, just pixie dust is basically what I depend on. And that, which is not a metaphor for cocaine, <laughs> by the way. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, to, to come back to what you're saying, asking me about that style with, 
with uh, Heart of Darkness. So I was developing a style that was in, in, with the New Yorker cartoons that allowed me to do something, be a little bit more realistic when it was appropriate, be, uh, but working with like a black pencil. And as I thought about how to approach Heart of Darkness, I thought, you know, that really would would work well for this because it's a little sketchbooky. I can be a little looser with it. There's room for sort of, uh, it, it's not like a pen and ink line. It's, it's dedicated, I mean, at least the way I do it. And that uh, this gave me a lot more room and I, using washes, watercolor washes and, and things that was were more atmospheric, which I also do in my cartoons. And so there, I can really see the two, it, 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 there's not like a, here's this one style for this book and I'm putting myself in a compartment yeah. for that and here's the style I'm going to draw. I, I, it has become seamless in moving back and forth between the things and there's aspects where I get more, I needed a lot of reference to do Heart of Darkness. I mean, there's there's clothing and boats and, and characters and, and finding all that and the Congo and all the, the flora and fauna and... Um, uh, and getting back to what I was saying about going to Mexico to get the sound and the smell and all that, uh, I had a revelatory moment or two where I put on the sounds of the jungle while I was drawing the jungle. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, all this is accessible with the Internet. I mean, it is really the, the joys of what yeah, you can get yeah. Is, yeah. is fantastic. So I, f you know, flipped it on for two hours while doing these full scenes of, of jungle and just listening to birds and all that. And then I had to do a scene where uh, there's drumming, you know, and th that I put on a whole series of, of uh, African drumming sounds, you know, dr drumming music. And it, uh, it really made literally the strokes I was making were affected yeah. by that, which I, you know, I, I like, how, I, and I recommend that to students when it'll like think about what music might fit for something that you're working on. And maybe, in fact, one of the assignments is to translate a song into a comic. Mm -hmm. And that part of that idea is that you're listening, you're, you're having an uh, auditory sensation that will affect how you draw it, and that that should be part of what's going on. So there's these different uh, aspects of the, of the form that are not even what's you know, going to end up on the paper, but, but will end up in the visuals. Hopefully. They inform everything. They inform it. Yeah. yeah. Do you listen to music with words when you're working? I, I only, there's a point, my favorite point in the process, which is the one I'm at right now, I've done the heavy lifting on the, the writing, on the writing. I can't listen to anything at all when, when I have to write. Okay. And, and, and I, I sort of dread it. I'll admit it's like, and also just, there's a lot of figuring, so the, my, my process for, for breaking down books, and I do this at this point, I, the, I, I can't seem to avoid this, these stages. I start by breaking down the text. Like I'll go through the, read the book several times. I've listened to the audio book, you know, eight times. And um, in, in Mexico, I'd go for a walk and listen to it. Mm -hmm. And I got all sorts of great ideas for how to do the, the visuals from that. And I still, even while I'm working on it now, I've listened to it another three times and, and keep hitting new things. So I break down the text and I'm underlining in the book particular sentences and paragraphs and making note of descriptions of characters and so that I can go back through it. Then I thumbnail the book on an half by 11 piece of paper that it has tiny little double page spread squares that indicate the two pages of the book because I have to work and see what's going to happen, how your eye will go across. And it's like getting to see the book at a distance, which is really helpful uh, for, for um, understanding where your eye will move on the page, where the reader's eye is going to move on the page when I, when I'm seeing it tiny like that. Then I go from the, that tiny where I sometimes am writing the words and indicating what page has the phrase I want and then starting to do little sketches of things. And then once I have that there, then I can really get all the reference I'm, that, that I need and start looking at who, what the characters are going to look like and do a lot of that kind of warm up. And then I do booklets that are one third size of the printed book. And I actually staple together, you know, cut eight and a half by 11 in half and then fold it and make these little booklets. And I'm drawing in the booklet uh, as tightly as I can and writing the, the text in there 
And that's what I then scan. Then I scan the, these booklets and I can insert the text as an overlay. And I have these fonts that are based on my, my lettering. You don't miss hand lettering at all, do you? Um, I, no, I don't miss hand lettering, but I, I, I still like it occasionally, but I, li- I like having it be my font as opposed to yeah, generic you know, or, or selective. whatever they, yeah. you know, the, that can be incredibly cold and you know, it's nice. There's a lot of mixing and matching you can do with that where to make it, um, there, you know, certain sound effects and things like that, that are, of course I'm going to draw, but then I, when I scan it, I can put the text in, then I can really go through and look at it and I end up with the whole book in that form, which I then showed to my editor so that I, I can see, you know, if there's going to be, or if I was doing it for myself, I, that's where I could find out whether I stumble right anywhere and, yeah. and I can change things more. And if I have to add a page or, you know, make these decisions, but by doing it as a booklet, I'm already reading it as a book in that form, that one third size. Then I take that, I blow that up to the print size and I do a tight pencil from that, which is still, I'm working, you know, same size. That way I'm not adding a ton of details that will be useless. I can see what ty- size that the type should be and you know, figure out space for word balloons and all the, all that, uh, up- approach and then have uh, yet another round of having it edited. In this case, I was showing it to the editor. And that's also in a fine enough form that we could show this to some scholars. I was show, I, I showed it to somebody from Columbia, uh, somebody from Brown, somebody from Princeton, and somebody from Harvard, uh, ultimately. And um, uh, that and showed it to a number of other uh, readers, friends and other, other literary people who so I could get as much feedback as possible. And and I got a lot of feedback, you know, and specifically, you know, like how I portrayed black people in it, uh, where, where somebody didn't follow something um, and and that it's still early enough stage where I can make adjustments and and say, like, all right, fine. Then in the next phase, which is the final art, I will I'll adjust that face. I'll think about um, you know, the, the storytelling and maybe in some cases I, I have to redraw things. And you're going to be out by fall 19. It'll be out by fall 19. Okay. I'm, I'm at, it just sounds like such a laborious process. It is. Well, so. <laughs> in this case, it's been a year that I'm yeah. now in the, the phase and I had that I have been in for, for uh, a while now where, um, I'm working pretty much seven days a week and, Except well, some schlub from New Jersey shows up. Well, no, I take a uh, you know I take a break for the, for the microphone part, but yeah. um, no, it's not like it. My my life comes to a, a complete halt. I do go home and see my wife and daughter, um, but uh, you know have dinner and then I come back and work usually from like eight thirty until midnight. So I have these. I, I'm having very long days. But uh, to answer an earlier question regarding so the writing phase of that and actually all those stages, even the penciling right up to the finished art, I'm, I have to concentrate so much that I, I can very rarely have even music on. Mm-hmm. And so it's, a, it's a long silent period. In this case, it was like maybe eight months of that more silent period. Yeah. And then, uh, then I hit the doing of the art, which is really, you know, it's in a hugely important part and I have to concentrate on it, but I can actually, I'll spend more time drawing every, the, the leaves of a jungle if I have some other thing going on. So I'm yeah. listening to podcasts and I'm listening. I've made my way through binge watch several TV shows, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, and movies, but they really have to hit the right tone. First of all, it has to be a lot of dialogue so I can listen and not yeah. watch. Nothing with subtitles, uh, yeah. no subtitles at yeah. all. That killed narco for me. Uh, yeah. but, uh, there's, uh, I thought your there's Spanish some, is pretty good. It not sufficient. Not good I have to think way too hard gotcha. in order to to do that. And yeah, and they're also you know they're it's rapid fire Spanish is not. Is there any other not kind? My, yeah. Well, I'm kidding. Actually, I'm the stereotyping. Mexi- no, the kidding, suave but. the suave Mexican uh, Spanish is you know it's really there's a lot of Loser. looking at a person's face though when you when uh. they're speaking where I get what they're saying mm-hmm. more. Uh, but uh, if I find the right thing. And it's curious. I found Westerns have been really good for this. Like uh, Godless is one thing I watched that was, you know, it's it's got action in these characters or, or that are, you know, in extreme situations. It kind of relates to the material. And sure. so I feel this sort of degree of tension. I saw Ozark. That was another one that had this 
yeah. high tension and and very you know there's there's a lot of angst and tremendous dialogue. Um, but I've also then turned back to listening to Heart of Darkness in in varying audiobooks read by different people, which is also really interesting. Yeah. Again, it's different than translation directly, although everything you guys are doing, both what you're doing as a comic and and somebody reading it is an act of translation, I guess, even though it's, you know, written native English. But right, right. Dealing with a quote unquote legit publisher or a literary publisher as opposed to the, the comics publishers of your past, how's the the process different in that respect? Um they have they have a lot of specific processes mm-hmm. processes and then uh, there's like a book cover art director. It's different from the interior. And okay. so there's different slots having, this is my second book now with Norton and the, the Kafka was a learning about that process and stumbling through some of it and, and that figuring out what, you know, how many, how often I could pull the files and redo them yeah. before they would pull their <laughs> hair completely out. And that, that was and it's good because now it's a much smoother process. I do mm-hmm. understand what what their expectations are and what what can happen. And I have my fingers deep, deep in the process because I do the book in InDesign. I'm I'm pretty much bringing in Making a the very pages for them, and, and I'm setting I'm setting yeah. everything up. But then there's the the places that somewhere between my skill set and my my interest like say uh, setting the the type and, and getting it properly positioned at a certain point i noodle with that so much and it drives me crazy it's really great if somebody who knows that well can deal with it and also i get the copy editing which is gold because there's so many you know having somebody go through the book and catch every spelling error which i guarantee i will have and and you know see where that where there's a little bit of extra space between words or what the modest things that it used to be with with the smaller publishers that i'm i worked with over the years that all landed on me and the book would go out not having necessarily passed through other eyes and that's yeah. frightening as hell you know, I've had covers where where it's just off a little bit to one side because when when you print a cover, a hard cover, there's this a section that dips into yeah. you know, along the spine, and I had trouble calculating that. And so I'm I'm desperately hoping always for a last finishing somebody. I want to have full control right up until that moment, and then I want to say, would you give this one solid look and tell me, you know, where noodle with that so it works. And not have your name misspelled on the spine or anything. For example, I, yeah. that I could, I cover that pretty well, but, yeah. uh, but there's, there, there's so many moving parts to doing a book and part of the modern world is all these jobs have mostly landed. They've been condensed and they've landed in the lap of the artist and yeah. which is lame because I, I hate that so many jobs have been taken away and it means my job is that much more complicated. I love the part where I have that much control but um, and and I'm involved some in these books sometimes right up to the physical print decisions of you know whatever there's going to be embossing debossing and spot gloss and uh, color on the edge of the book like I did with ruins on the you know the four edge of the book right is got is orange and whether there's a a a, a tail book marker attached and even right down to the way the book is sewn in, what color the sewing is going to be. Those are decisions that I end up making happily. And, you know, uh, I don't want to have to be dealing with the printer to the point where I'm Flying following, to China. I'm, or I, actually, or following, the, the, yeah. following the ship, you know, and yeah. wringing my hands over that. But yeah. that it did say Kafka Ask was printed in the U.S. Was that a decision that was that a decision by, any... the, by the publisher okay, and, I didn't know you had any a, say in that. it was a, it was a great decision it was you know for t- for timing that was that that was they they, they were able to i'm um, happily on many counts you yeah. know that it's that's in in the u.s um and also that um that that just means that the turnaround is not that yeah. two three months which is kind of horrifying when you get close to a deadline or the book gets stuck in the panama canal like emil ferris's that, book that, oh did that, that happen how oh, much Oh, horror months. It was supposed to come out, I think, six months or eight months earlier oh, and just oh. sat on a boat because oh, that's uh, bankruptcy on the shipper, not the uh, the printer. Right. And they, everything on the ship was held. 
And uh, it's like, okay, we'll just launch your life's work a year late. And wow. See yeah. Goes. Well, there's always, you know, worked out okay for her. This, so, it did. It yeah. did. Um, and, and well deservedly so. Yeah. But that, yeah, that, that, that whole process, I mean, the, the printed work is really, is the ultimate thing also. There's, you know, I, I can do everything right up to the edge and then the print shop can have problems. Yeah. And, uh, I, in, in ruins, I had a, uh, a, I have a gatefold in there and in the Italian edition of it, the, the, it, and it's, it has to go right. It's a very careful thing to make it yeah. gatefold properly. And in the Italian edition, um, uh, I guess a third of the copies got cut a little too close and the gatefold therefore was falling out and they had to just throw those out. Mm. So that's not on, you know, that's a typical it's a collector's edition. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially. Remember those days. Yeah. Well, they went back to print really fast, which was great. So. Yes. Yeah, New edition. Uh, I don't know if you want to reveal it or not, but dream project to adapt. Oh, gosh. Um, is, or is there something that, man, if I really had the time. Since I'm knee deep in, I'm on my second uh, um, one there. Yes, there are. Of course, I, my first dream project was Grapes of Wrath. And I tried to hunt that down back in the 90s after I did uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, hot to trot for doing the idea of like, wow, I'd love to do another something like this. And and my favorite book being Grapes of Wrath, I was like, I really want to do that. And I reached out to the agent for Steinbeck and sent him a copy of the jungle and this was in 1990 and he hated it and he said you know the idea that anybody would dare use comics yeah. for literature was already abhorrent to him mm -hmm. and he said i'd have to go a long way to uh to even just get past him and i realized like okay that was that time period and i i just backed away from it but um uh so that is Still, still it's still a book that I, I mean, I still love it and reread it, but, um, uh, I, w I will definitely take a breather before I do that. I, I, the, something that is percolating now is, um, uh, there was an article in the New York times a couple of weeks ago about the insect apocalypse. I don't know if you saw yeah, this. Yeah, so I haven't read it, but I saw the. So I'm uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is is entomology and that and it's uh, the and, Kafka thing. I'm just and go well, <laughs> actually, that, that's not completely wrong. Uh, ruins is filled with insects. There's a, one. The character is an entomologist. So it, it gave me a lot of opportunity to do that in in Heart of Darkness. I'm there's a lot of flora and fauna and I'm drawing little bugs on the ground and, you know, wherever I can, not necessary, but part of what I enjoy doing and, yeah. and giving it atmosphere. So to do a whole book that's about what's going on with insects is very appealing to me and, um, that I'm, I haven't gotten any further than that besides I'd, I'd like to do something that was that scholarly that is addressing the fact that right now we're in this die off that will affect everything. And that, to bring it back to that notion of like, I have to be working on something that I feel like I'm talking about yeah. what's happening now because they sort of, my level of urgency is really quite high. And as, as, as you know, naturally as I, I assume or expect, to, you know, most thinking people right. have that same experience. Well, it know? raises the question. We last spoke December, 2015. Usually when I sit down for a second time with someone, I go back and listen to the previous one, make sure we don't ask the same questions. Or that I don't. The, and I pretty much said everything all over again, right? Well, I, I don't know because the problem is I was going through the show notes before playing it and it mentioned uh, he tells us the GOP candidate he's most fearful of. And I was afraid that on the one side, uh, in late 2015, you named the correct one or potentially that you named someone like Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush or something thinking right. that was as bad as it could get and you were right. going to look dumb. So either way, I was afraid to, to go back and listen to our past one for fear of, you know, coming across that moment and finding that, oh, he thought it was going to be bad, but it yeah. turned out, you know, he had yeah. no idea where things were going to go. It's like when I recorded with Dan Perkins, uh, Tom Tomorrow, the s spring of 2016. Um, and I'm, I think I was one of the early people to ask him, isn't it great you have all this material? I think it was even 2015 that, that summer. And he's like, yeah, no, really, it's not, Gil, because yeah. I see where things are going. I'm like, oh, don't be stupid. Um, and it turned out I was the stupid one here. Yeah, but, yeah um, well, it was that was hard to 
you know, even as you saw it coming, it was hard to visualize. I liked, I like traveling. I like going, I certainly, I've said yes to almost everything since he's been elect, elected just to, um, or, or elected or not, as the case may be, as we are learning that, uh, so, and then really enjoy being in other countries and uh, being able to apologize in part and also compare notes because yeah. pretty much every, everywhere else I go, you, they have their own version of something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I hate having this material. I really would be very, very happy to not have it, to have a tranquil time of, you know, there, there's always, there will always be things to talk about and there's no, there's no issue. There's no shortage of material. Sure. It's just that, that when it's extreme like this, it feels like it's a constant fight to not lose your mind. And that, that I, uh, even while I'm working on this project that I have to work on constantly, I'm still waking up every morning dreading the paper. The, the, well, yeah. I'm reading, no, yeah. I read the paper and I look at my newsfeed and I, and I sketch up a drawing and I pitch it to the New Yorker daily. Yeah. And I'm doing that kind of five days a week. And when I'm not doing that, I'm pitching to the nib. And when I'm not doing that, I, along with uh, Steve Brodner and Andrea Arroyo, um, two other artists, yeah. uh, great artists that that uh, um, you got to get me in with Brodner because he keeps saying maybe. But I yeah. talk to Lou Skill. I don't know if you want me on your show. Oh, I, I really do want to get him on. Oh, so. OK, you know, he'd be I think yeah. he'd be a great guest. Uh, uh, we we uh, co-art direct a spot at the nation on their website called op art that we are posting five days a week, uh, political art of all sorts. So like, um, if I see a good something on the street, I'll photograph it and that'll go be part of it. Uh, we have people doing, uh, murals and, um, embroideries and illustrators and political cartoonists. And it's just a complete range. And the whole goal is to have like a really big voice from as many and from different countries, you know, I'm looking for artists from around the world and, uh, and that, that are mostly addressing what's happening here, but not strictly, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. what we ran something yeah. Yeah. by a Spanish artist about what was happening in Brazil with the new. I was going to say, we're, uh, as bad as it is, we're not the center of the universe, or at least there, there's there's still a world around us where there's uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But part of kind of part of the the aim for for op art has been mostly focusing on what's going on sure. with with our current events because you really can't five days a week is not you know. You need eight days a week uh, and, and more in order to begin to, you know, we're rejecting mountains of things. And some days we even post like four drawings um, and we have Mondays. We uh, usually do something on gun control. We try to have like a gun piece per week uh, and and post the number of gun deaths so far yeah. or some, you know, lovely statistic like that and uh, do a lot of environmental pieces, of course. And so that. That's what's uh, for me is how I'm maintaining my sanity, where I where I'm actually kind of cheerful while I'm. I was going to ask because uh, you, you don't seem we're all anxiety laden, but you don't seem jittery so much as, you know, I want to say up to the challenge almost. Yeah, I I, I mean, I have this out, um, but buzzing in my head at all times is the uh, the horror movie of, um, you know, the future that it's like you know, we're at this precipice where you can see, you can see it from here, you know, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's right. It's in, in the, uh, uh, rear view mirror or in the, you know, right in front of the headlights. But, um, so I, I can't help but visualize that a lot. And some days that leads to more drinking than others. <laughs> but, uh, um, but for the most part, Art has been like my saving grace in terms of having an outlet. So I'm not just having these things run around in my head and scream. It's either that or more paint fumes. If you go back to the stencils, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give that a pass. Thanks. <laughs> kidding. Peter, thanks so much for coming on. And once again, thank you. And that was Peter Cooper. His new book is Kafkaesque, 14 Stories, published by W.W. W. Norton. Also, because Peter can't slow down, he is now finished with adapting Heart of Darkness, which Norton will publish in the fall of 2019. 
A uh, new issue of World War III Illustrated just came out, entering its 40th year of publication. Uh, Peter's also co-art directing Op Art, a political art site sponsored by The Nation magazine. And he's regularly on The New Yorker and The Nib websites, as well as in his 23rd year at MAD. Uh, you should check out his brand new site, petercooper.com, to see all that stuff and his earlier work. Now, that's P-E-T-E-R-K-U-P-E-R dot -E -E com. World War Three Illustrated is at www.nyc, and opart is at thenation.com slash opart. Opart is O-P-P-A-R-T. After we wrapped, I asked Peter, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet. The third quarter 2018 episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Moby, Audrey Niffenegger, Mark Ulrichson, David Lloyd, Glenn David Gold, Ken Crimstein, Hal Mayforth, Lance Richardson, and Nathaniel Popkin. I'll get the fourth quarter episode up soon, I promise. They could support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. And I recorded this episode at Peter's Studio in New York City. That means 12 bucks or so at the George Washington, another 30 for parking, uh, but it was in walking distance of the garage, so no subway fare. Oh, I also got a coffee. And if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Board Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. Oh, and Jim Ottaviani. I, I missed that one. Anyway, they all went over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have a full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash VM. Now, our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with novelist, essayist, biographer, and scholar Edmund White, whose new book is a reading memoir called The Unpunished Vice. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, tell people about it on social media, and go to iTunes, where you can look up the Virtual Memories Show and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It'll all help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 